Hello, well it's the start of March and therefore it's the, the first Sunday in March in particular and therefore time for NTSAN number three. Uh, so apologies from Chris Lintot this week but I'm joined by Lucy Green and we're hoping to have Pete Lawrence with us as well. Uh, we had some technical difficulties so he's currently not uh, uh, not with us at the moment but fingers crossed he'll be uh, he'll be back before the uh, the end of the hangout. Um, so I guess Lucy it's been uh, it's been an an exciting month, or particularly this last week's been exciting, hasn't it? It has. Well, for me and for many other people around the UK, this week was fantastically exciting because we got to see something very rare, and that was the display of the aurora down into the south of England. Now, I didn't manage to see it, I'm afraid. Where I live is far too light polluted. I don't know if you got a view, Chris. Uh, no, I uh, I didn't get a view uh, too light polluted down here in Cardiff and also a little bit too far south. Although people around South Wales and this sort of latitude did see it. So uh, I obviously didn't try hard enough. Yeah, yeah, it was an interesting one because when I first heard that the aurora was being seen, I didn't think that the, so the aurora is uh, joined, uh, formed by geomagnetic activity and I wasn't expecting that an auroral display would be formed for the level that we saw. It wasn't that big a geomagnetic storm. But I think what was interesting is that so many people are now getting out with their cameras and doing long exposure images that actually we're picking up the display with the cameras more than the human eye. And then, of course, they get sent around on social media. <clears throat> oh, I see Pete's joined us. Hello. <laughs> You're very quiet again, Pete. <laughs> So I thought it might be worth saying um, a bit about how the aurora form because there's lots of discussion about, okay, we know that the sun is the origin of the energy that, that creates the northern lights, but how in particular does it form? And I think there's one sort of misconception that quite often gets talked about, which is that it's solar wind, so this, this flow of charged particles and magnetic field from the sun that heads out into space and then collides with the Earth's atmosphere. And um, I wanted to show a couple of images that one of my colleagues, Chris Arridge, makes at um, MSSL to sort of uh, introduce us to, uh, to what's happening. So this one here is an image that shows a sort of cross-section of the Earth and its magnetic field. And you've got the sun on the right-hand side and the solar wind is then rushing in and hitting the Earth's magnetic field and you can see that it's squashed up on the sunward side and it's really stretched out on the night side. And I wanted to show this image because it really illustrates that the solar wind can't get to the Earth's atmosphere. So you can just see the Earth is, um, I'm not sure if my cursor is showing here, but the Earth is this tiny sort of blue and yellow spot down here. So that's where our atmosphere is. But the solar wind comes in and gets deflected around the Earth's magnetic field. So it, it can't actually directly reach our atmosphere. We have this sort of natural shield. And um, well, the particles so then, themselves can't can't get here. So the, the, all these particles, this million is it a billion tons of matter moving at a million miles an hour? They they don't actually get here. No, no. Only on very very rare occasions because they need to punch a hole through the magnetic shield, and that does sometimes happen. But it, it's not like the flow can just directly impinge on our atmosphere. And the kind of image that I also like to show is is one like this. Okay, so this is the same sort of um, image now. Uh, so again, this is made by Chris Arridge, and I sort of flipped it a bit so the sun is now sort of behind us and you're looking at the Earth and the Earth's magnetic field. But what's nice is that Chris has colour-coded different sections of the Earth's magnetic field, and they illustrate where we find high-energy particles, much, much higher energy than those that come in with the solar wind. And it's actually these particles that are already trapped in the Earth's magnetic field that for some reason get accelerated and come down into the Earth's atmosphere, lighting up the gas at the top, so the oxygen, the nitrogen, making it glow to form the northern light. So it's, it's acceleration of particles already in our magnetosphere that does the job. Okay, what's the sun got to do with it in that case? Well, last week what we had was a coronal mass ejection that left the sun on the 25th, got here on the 27th, and it put energy into the Earth's magnetic field, which then led to the particles being accelerated. So the sun still plays an important role, but the particles themselves that create the northern lights come from our own magnetic field. And, and Pete, I know that you spent the last uh, the, the last week basically living and breathing the uh, the northern lights. Uh, so have you 
got a, an, an image, I believe, to show us that I think is uh, or should be on screen at the moment. Is that on my screen at the moment? That and Pete Glastonbury, a fantastic picture of the uh, rural storm that occurred on the... Um, I've lost my dates because I've been flying over the last nine nine days. 27th. Seven times. I've got no, the 20th. Yeah, 27th, 28th. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, but it's a fantastic picture and it shows very nicely that lovely green um, hue from um, oxygen being accepted at the bottom there. And the lovely reds and purples on the top. Now that red bit on the extreme left of the image is the bit which I think was most prominent for a lot of people. Um, in the UK because the green dropped below the horizon so what pe most people saw was that sort of reddish glow and I know there was a photograph from Darren Baskell I believe from Brighton um, that managed to pick up the red from there so um, it was it was visible a long way down the country and it's also worth saying perhaps that the um, the active region which generated the um, or was responsible for the CME that actually came off um, is the same one that generated the CME when I was up with Liz Bonin doing the Stargazing Live huh? Aurora Hunt. So that was, a, in those days, it was AR 1944, and then it came around again and became AR 1967, and now it's AR 1990, so it's been around three times. And, and Pete, is it common for sunspots like this to, to come round again, to, to see them time after time? A, a big one will persist for a while, but we haven't had a big one like this for ages, have we, Lucy? I mean, no, no. A bit black, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, so, and there's something... <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. There's something for amateur astronomers, I think, to look out for, and that's the formation sites of sunspots. And if you monitor the sun over time, so really week to week, month to month, then you see that new sunspots tend to form in the location of either pre-existing or old sunspots. So if you can sort of work out um, a grid on the sun of longitude and latitude, you'll see there are longitudes that are uh, where sunspots preferentially form. And Cassini observed this in the early 1700s, and they got called um, uh, active longitudes or active nests. So it may be that in that long-lived region, Pete, that you're talking about, that actually there was new magnetic field forming and new sunspots forming, you know, as this thing has been rotating around the sun. And presumably this is because they're magnetic phenomena, and so that magnetic uh, disturbance, if you like, that's just below the surface of the sun or on the surface of the sun persists and, and generates new ones. Is that the, the thinking? Yeah, so it's something to do with... Um, uh, process is happening about one third of the way into the sun and for some re reason new, you're right new magnetic field keeps rising up from the solar interior through the surface and into the atmosphere I'm not sure it's fully understood really why you would have preferential sites it's due, due to mechanisms happening inside the sun where it's hard to make observations okay we do because we have the technique of helioseismology but I'm not sure that models would reproduce that kind of activity but I think it says something about the fact that the magnetic field evolution inside the Sun isn't a symmetric evolution there's regions where it's stronger and regions where it's weaker and the regions where it's stronger is then where you get this um, flux emergence we would say in the formation of sunspots so that's that's a beautiful image there I mean there there the sunspots look quite uh, spread out over the surface of the Sun but if you monitored over time you would see actually there's certain longitudes that where you you tend to see repeated formation of sunspots. And Pete, this is you one you took recently, is it? Uh, yeah, it's one I took yesterday. Um, and at the active region, which is AR 1990, you see the, I don't know if you can't see my cursor, right? Um, but you've got the three main spots which are over towards in the left side of the, um, the sun's disk there. Um, AR 1990 is the right most of those three, so the ones, the one above the other two, does that make any sense? Yeah, I think so. Um, but that's that's it. But there are actually quite a few patches of sunspot activity now, which is quite quite nice. I mean, we've been through. Have we been through so maximum? I think we have, haven't Lucy? And it's it's been pretty. Um, I think we probably have. in terms of sunspot. 
It has been. It's been disappointing. And another thing that's interesting about that region is that, so like you say, it was on the edge of the sun from our perspective when the CME left. And the, even though the model yeah. said the eruption would reach us, it said it would give us a glancing blow, I didn't believe that it could drive such a strong response at the Earth. And I think it just goes to show that you have got to be monitoring the sun all the time because even when you, you least expect it, or when you least expect it, the sun can still have a really strong effect on us. Well, I, th I think we yeah, can um, uh, uh, move on. We should probably move on to... Uh, to other topics besides the sun, but before we do, we should uh, obviously answer a, uh, answer a question or two. So we've got one come in, I believe, from Bill Irving, who says, uh, uh, do all CMEs, coronal mass ejections, go at the same speed, or is there a variation? My eight-year-old was asking me after the display, and I couldn't answer her. Oh. So, uh, so Lucy, can you uh, yeah. answer Bill's question? Lovely question. So, and actually, with <laughs> they are oh, excuse me, it is interesting to look at the speeds of of these eruptions. So, when they leave the sun, they can be travelling with speeds of between well, from as low as one hundred kilometers a second. Okay, that probably doesn't sound very low, but the the top speeds can be maybe up to three thousand kilometers a second. But what's really interesting is that by the time they reach the Earth. The slow ones have sped up, and the fast ones have slowed down. So their speeds when they get here are, are around 400 kilometers a second. And the reason that they speed up and slow down is because there's also this flow of the solar wind, and they interact with that. And the slow ones get swept up, and the fast ones sort of get, get dragged and slowed down. It's a really good question. It's quite, it's quite a complicated thing to actually do the prediction of. Um, lots of different models that come when the CME, um, which don't all we in terms of the time of arrival. Yeah, the models are do give us a, a, a wide um, time range time range at which the CMEs arrive, plus or minus I don't know twelve hours or so. And I guess that's because you don't know what is between the leading edge of the CME and us, because you've only got a like, pace way monitoring the, um, the solar wind, but there's not a lot. The no. Solar wind. No, so you have to have a model of what the solar wind's doing, and that may or may not be accurate. You're still a little bit quiet there, Pete. Sorry, I lost my video as well. I think it's my <laughs> connection here that's. Um, I am still. Well, we can still there. Uh, we can still hear uh, just about what you're saying. I think so. That's that's all good. Um, well, we should move on to uh, what's coming up in the uh, in the future, I suppose, in the coming uh, the coming weeks. So, um, Pete, do you think you could give us your uh, rundown of what's to look for in the the coming weeks in the night sky? Yeah, sure. Um, you haven't got my video, but uh, you don't need to see my face. You know I exist. Um, I think the <laughs> first or the main thing to look out for in March is on the 16th when there is a transit or no transit um, on Jupiter. So that's when two moons will cast their shadows onto this disk and the shadows will appear at exactly the time on the disk simultaneously. Um, Ganymede's shadow will cross Jupiter's disk at about 2200 hours on the 16th and Io will follow about 20 minutes later. So that's something to look out for because you get single shadow transit where a, a moon will cast a shadow on the disk quite often. Um, but to get a double one is less common. And to get a treble one is really uncommon. And there's one of those coming up in the middle of the year as well. Um, but we should also mention that on the 20th of March, it's the, um, the X is with us. So that's the time when the center of the sun crosses the um, so the equator, so it's moving from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. Now that has a knock-on effect because that gives us the fastest rate of change of, um, or, or the change of the length of daylight that we get throughout the year. Now that beautiful constellation of Orion, which hangs there so magnificently, or it has been hanging there so magnificently over the last few weeks, will rapidly from view as it heads towards the west every evening, moving slightly further to the west at the same time from consecutive nights. 
the increase in um, daylight, the twilight coming up, just engulf the constellation. So if you like Orion, get a good look at it, look at it now because it won't last for much longer. On the 21st, the moon will be one degree south of Saturn, so um, that's something else to look out for. And that's quite a nice thing to pick up. It's a nice thing to try and photograph. Um, and there's uh, some interesting things happening with Saturn later. I think I believe it's in October. The moon will actually be in front of Saturn. So this is a good time to try and get your photographic skills together to actually image the two objects together in the night sky. Venus is at its greatest western elongation on the 22nd of March, and that's visible in the sky before sunrise. But Venus, like Mercury, Mercury's in the morning sky, are not well placed at the moment. They're quite low down. The, um, what else are we going to talk about? The, on the 31st, there is a chance to see a very thin waxing crescent moon as well after sunset. And I, I love hunting those really, really thin crescent moons um, as the sun's gone down. That's quite a challenge to pick those up. If you miss it on the 31st, and as you head into next month, the event will get bigger and bigger, of course, and you get some fantastic crescents at this time of year because they're well placed. They're high up in the sky after the sun has set. That'll do for me. Well, we've had a we've had a question about observing. Um, so uh, someone who goes by the name of uh, an astrophotography magazine, I believe, uh, asks, "What are the dates of the meteor showers in March, please?" So, uh, Pete, uh, putting you on the spot a little bit, uh, uh, any meteor showers in March off the top of your head? Uh, it's putting me on the spot a little bit. The meteor showers, major meteor showers in March. That I'm aware I can't of. think of any. Nothing, nothing particularly major mm -hmm. happening in March. I can't think of any. No. I'll look it up. I'll look it up. I don't think there's anything major happening in March. Interesting um, meteor shower which is coming up, which isn't fatal for us, unfortunately, um, is in a couple of months' time in May. Where we have a new media shower occurring, but um, for March, more. Okay, so not not a great month for uh, meteors. Now, you mentioned the uh, the moon at the end of uh, that that piece there uh, about what's to what's to come up, and there was a story in the last uh, last few weeks about uh, something that's been going on on the moon, which is impacts, and this is actually an impact. The, the latest one that's hit the news is an impact that happened back in September of last year. Uh, but this was uh, an impact on the moon by a, a rock that, well, a, a small asteroid that was probably about a meter across, weighing about 400 kilograms, uh, and uh, hit the moon at something like 40,000 miles an hour, as uh, space rocks tend to. And there's even a little video, which if I try and um, uh, if I try and share my uh, uh, the appropriate video, I can um, hopefully get as back so if I share uh, I'm just looking at the the video that's on um, on YouTube at the moment uh, here we go so uh, if I play this video um, then you should see a, a flash appear by the little blue arrow there we go uh, so that was observed by uh, an array of telescopes or a collection of telescopes uh, s constantly observing the moon uh, back in or all the time, and they, they saw that back in September on the sort of the Earth shine side of the moon, the side of the moon that isn't lit directly by the sun, but at that time was lit by reflected life light uh, off the Earth, and it really shows that you know the the moon is still uh, still things happening on the moon. The, this explosion, uh, which is the well, this impact, the largest one ever recorded, tells us uh, or can tell us a little bit more about the uh, the uh, the makeup of asteroids that are uh, flying around. Um, of course, this type of asteroid, just a meter across, wouldn't have made it through the Earth's atmosphere. It would have burnt up. So that kind of thing is of no danger uh, to the Earth. Um, but the moon without an atmosphere was a, a sitting duck and got uh, got pummeled uh, by it. So it's probably left a crater about 40 meters across. I haven't seen any reports of images from it, uh, of this crater from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, which is uh, orbiting the moon and taking very high resolution images. Uh, all the time, but hopefully at some point some will come through and we'll be able to see what kind of uh, what, what kind of mess this impact made. But uh, there's always something going on, which is uh, always good. Um, and I guess we can also uh, take a few more questions. So, um, what questions have we got uh, coming here? Uh, so, Lucy, there's someone referring to the sun again. Um, mm -hmm. As you might, uh, uh, as you might expect, given what we talked about. So, uh, so Damien Weatherly asks, 
What are the chances of another display like last week's, i.e. as far south as central England? So these these size displays are really probably once or twice every decade in their frequency. So I was thinking back in 2003 we had a really large sunspot on the sun that produced corona mass ejections and they they did produce I think a couple of displays in 2003. I missed both of them um, but I remember that there were, were reports in, in South Wales and in South England and that was back in 2003 when we were at the height of the solar cycle again and now here we are 11 years later back at solar maximum. So we might get a couple more if we're lucky this solar maximum and then we'll be waiting probably several years. So um, sorry now I've I've been talking I've forgotten exactly what the question was. What, what, sorry, what are the chances of another display like, like last week? So Re low likelihood, but not impossible. You know what? And and Pete, you saw the one. I remember uh, you said you saw images of it back in two thousand and three. Was it um, that yeah. you saw some great images from down the south coast? Yeah, that's right. I can remember going down to the beach and um, taking the camera down there and picking up some some quite nice activity actually. Um, so that was that was a pretty good one. But the the spot or the active region which caused the one um, on the 27th is moved, moving around to the central position of the sun at the moment, isn't it? So if it's, I don't know if it's still active, I've not been following it in that much detail, but if it is active, it's moving into a much more geo-effective position. So if it does go off again. Mm. Yeah. We're the sitting ducks then. <laughs> We'd be sitting ducks, yeah. That one would have caused us a bit of grief, wouldn't it? An X 4.9. I think so, yeah, because the larger the flare, the faster, normally I think, the, the faster the coronal mass ejection. So, okay, the, the flare is this flash of light in the sun's atmosphere, but they happen at the same time and in the same place as these coronal mass ejections. They normally occur on a one-to-one -one basis in the big events. And the bigger the flare, the, it's a, just a symbol that there's more energy release. So the coronal mass ejection is faster and bigger and everything happens in these big events. That's quite an interesting point as well, isn't it? Because there's a common misconception that it's the flare which causes the CME, but that's not the case, is it? No, no. So that they are related, but I wouldn't necessarily say that one causes the other. And, well, if I was to say that, I'd be more likely to say that the flare causes, sorry, the CME causes the flare because of the way it stretches and distorts the magnetic field in the sun's atmosphere. Now, speaking of uh, flashes of light, we've had uh, <clears throat> another question that's come in. Uh, unlike uh, last NTSAN, there's no bright supernova to observe tonight. Uh, supernova 2014J, which, for those who uh, aren't in the know, is the one that uh, took place in uh, the galaxy M82 uh, a couple of months back, uh, is fading in the visible band, but reports in other bands, gamma ray, X ray, and radio, seem to show no detection. Why is that? And that comes from uh, John Murrell. Uh, well, to the best of my knowledge, then this this is this was a Type One A supernova in M eighty two, which is the best model uh, that we have. Is that this is a white dwarf star, the the uh, end state of a star like our sun, um, which has reached a critical mass uh, and essentially exploded in, in a massive explosion. This this supernova explosion, uh, and uh, what that means is that. Uh, the, the light we see in the visible uh, is essentially the radioactive decay of all the material uh, coming that's been produced in the massive explosion. In the X-rays and radio, with most supernovae, uh, you would see them from the uh, the extremely hot material around the star, and that's because most supernovae occur from the explosion of a massive star, uh, many times the mass uh, of our sun. This particular type of supernova, the Type 1A, uh, because it occurs from this type, this uh, white dwarf star, there's not normally as much material around them, so the X-rays and the radio uh, emission tends to be weaker, and you don't get uh, such a bright signature. So I think that's why there's no detection in uh, these other wavelengths, but I'm sure they'll still be uh, monitored uh, over time. Um, I think there, there has been another recent supernova in M99, if I recall, um, but that's... Um, not as bright, is it, Pete? 2014 L, isn't it, that one? Uh, is that L now? Okay, yeah. I think so, yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> right, in terms of uh, other questions, we can go back to um, Return to the Moon. Uh, so Stephen Brown asks, uh, are most TLP, that's transient lunar phenomena, uh, likely to be impacts uh, seen from Earth like the recent one? Now, now Pete, I don't know whether, whether you uh, can say anything about these transient lunar phenomena and what they may or may not be. Well, they, when I was a, a lad growing up, the TLP was actually often described as being the, the bright or slightly reddish patches um, that people had reported on the moon's surface. Um, but now, transient lunar phenomena also cover these impacts which you get, the, but the flashes which you can pick up on the dark side of the moon, or the dark portion of the moon, I shouldn't say dark side of the moon, should I? Or the dark portion, the night side, if you like, of the moon. Um, so I think that's the area where most interest lies in trying to detect those flashes, yeah. And th there's still a bit of controversy about the other type of event, the TLP event, with the, the, the brightening or the, the slight orangey glow um, around certain regions of the moon. Certain, some people will swear by them, other people will refute them completely. But the flashes are, are a definite, they are impact flashes. I think it's quite an interesting um, part of astronomy, actually. It could be an interesting development in imaging, especially, to try and pick up these things on, on an amateur basis. Um, I know there are cameras constantly looking at the moon to try and pick these events up, but it would be nice to get a, an amateur network going to do that as well. And there's some for the planets, Jupiter, for example. Um, there are if any clear night, you'll have people trying to image Jupiter. And I wonder how many impacts which don't leave a scar after they've impacted, they're just a bright flash, um, go unnoticed because people will be processing their images and they will, those flashes will be averaged out. It would be quite nice if the, uh, the processing software was adjusted slightly so it could actually look for the, these, these anomalies. That would be, I wonder how many it would pick up. Uh, yeah, it could be a, a, a great development um, in in coming years if this kind of uh, this kind of thing can be uh, be rolled out as you say in an amateur network uh, observing this stuff. That would be a, that would be fantastic. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left of our uh, half hour. In fact, about just over a minute. So um, uh, one one question that's come in uh, is: uh, Pete Lawrence must have had a blinder of a week with the northern lights coming so far south. Uh, what would be a great week for the rest of the NTSAN team? Um, so, Pete, first, first of all, question to you: Has it indeed been a blinder of a week for you? I have flown. Um, I, I work with a company taking people up to see the Northern Lights. We fly up, up to the edge of British airspace, and I've flown over the last nine days six times, and we have had four bright displays and two weak displays. Our night off was the night of the big CME <laughs> impact, which was rather unfortunate timing, because that would have been amazing. But I also had a charity flight last night, and the conditions were not looking great when we left, but there was a condition in the magnetic, in the solar wind, in the collapse solar wind, which was, was good for us, and I had a, an inkling that that was going to go the right way, and it did, and we got a fabulous display last night. So, yeah, it's been a good week. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, did, did, would there be any other type things that could happen to make a, a week better for you? Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of sleep <laughs> comes from Pete. Astronomers um, don't mean that. <laughs> now, uh, Lucy, uh, what about for you? What would make a, what make a good week for you? Hmm. Well, I want to get out and do a bit of observing Jupiter for National Astronomy Week this week. And um, so I think some clear skies to get my telescope out to do that, I think, would be good. Excellent. So a few, a few clear skies to do uh, to do observing. And, and, I mean, you mentioned National Astronomy. We haven't actually mentioned that yet. I can't believe we haven't. Uh, so National Astronomy Week is this week. Uh, so it started yesterday, the 1st of March, and runs through till the 8th of March. Uh, and there are lots of events going on all over the UK. If you want to find an event near you, uh, the website to go to is astronomyweek.org.uk, uh, and that will uh, show a, a map of events you can find there. 
Um, and there's also some interesting challenges, that uh, observing challenges to try and measure the speed of light from observations of Jupiter's moons. And there's lots of information about that on the site. We probably don't have time to uh, to go into that here, but that's an interesting uh, an interesting experiment to try and recreate. But from back in the uh, 17th century, I think was it, or the 18th century? I forget yeah, exactly. Six, 1676. That's the one. 17th century. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, recreating uh, those measurements. Uh, and I suppose I should probably answer what would uh, what would make a good week for me um, uh, to uh, answer my share of the question. Well, I guess some uh, some exciting going on in the night sky uh, that we can all that we can all look at. So things like a bright supernova is always good, but um, maybe one even closer, maybe a bright supernova in our galaxy that we can go and observe um, and get some fantastic pictures of it. Uh, there was one like that in 1987 in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is close to our galaxy. So uh, um, maybe uh, maybe something like that, uh, even closer uh, to home. Um, well, I think we're we're pretty much out of time now. Uh, any final thoughts, Pete or Lucy? Yeah, Chris. Yep. Just before uh, you go, don't forget Mars. Mars is now starting to come up at a reasonable hour in the middle of March. It's about nine o'clock-ish. It's above the horizon. And the way to locate Mars is to, to locate our old friend, the plough or saucepan, handle of it, and follow the arc round to that bright orange star, which is Arcturus, and continue the arc round, and you come to Spica, a bright star in Virgo. And Mars is right next door to Spica at the moment, and it's really quite stunning. Uh, so if you want to go and see Mars, uh, now is the, uh, the time to start looking for it. Excellent. Uh, Lucy, any final thoughts? No, I think just yeah, look out for the clear nights and get your cameras out. Look for some more aurora and uh, join in National Astronomy Week. Well, I guess uh, for now uh, that's it from us. So uh, best of luck to everyone taking part in National Astronomy Week um, and to the whole of March. I hope you everyone gets a, a clear view of uh, Jupiter and uh, Mars and a few of those other things that uh, Pete mentioned earlier on. This will be up on YouTube after the broadcast, so you can watch it again. Um, and uh, I guess this is now, that's three in three months, so I believe that probably makes it a regular occurrence, so um, I suspect that there'll be something going on, there'll be an NTSAN again uh, at the start of April. So uh, until then, thanks very much, goodbye. Goodbye.